would you bow your heads all over the room and would you take a couple moments to tell the Lord thank you for never failing you yet. Come on, all over this room and every home that's watching, would you take a couple moments to tell the Lord out loud thank you for never failing me yet. Come on, just begin to open your mouths wherever you are and begin to the Lord thank you for never failing me. Come on, just begin to praise Him right where you are. Begin to thank Him for how He's never failed you. Begin to thank Him for how He came through. Begin to thank Him for how He came through in your relationship. How He came through in your finances. How He came through and forgave you. For how He came through and healed you. For how He came through and took away the worries. For how He came through for your mother. For how He came through for your family. Right where you are, begin to thank Him out loud that He came through. Come on, in every home watching, tell Him thank you. Tell Him thank you. Tell him thank you. Tell him thank you. He came through for you when nobody else knew. He came through. He's opened doors for you. He came through. He's healed your body. He came through. He answered your prayers, he came through. He opened doors, he came through. He has protected you, he came through. He has restored you, he came through. He gave you sleep throughout the night, he came through. He came through. He came through. He came through. Hallelujah. Anybody in the room know he came through? Hallelujah. He came through. He came through. Whew. Hallelujah. Father, we bless your name in this house. We declare hallelujah to your name. And we worship you, God. Because every one of us in this room, every one of us that's watching, we can declare that you have come through. Woo, you came through, Lord. When we didn't know how, we didn't know what, we didn't know when, you came through. We are people that have been healed. We are people that have been restored. We are people that have been forgiven. We are people that's been given another chance. We are people that seen you heal bodies and heal emotionally and put us in our right mind and give us strength. And Father, we come today and say thank you, God, for who you are and how you work and what you do and what you've done and for what you are going to do. And we praise and we magnify and we exalt your name on today. Hallelujah to your name, God. You have come through. We give you glory and we give you praise in the name of Jesus. And the people of God said amen. Come on, you ought to give him your best praise. You ought to give him your best praise. You ought to lift up the name of Jesus and tell him, thank you, God, for coming through. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Somebody say, he'll come through. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless his name today. Family, you may take your seats in the room and we thank God for our online family. We thank God for our 
family here in the room, we are thankful. We are thankful, thankful, thankful. Boy, listen, the Lord has come through so many times. I, we thank God. Family, it is so incredibly good to see you on this Sunday morning, and it's great to start the week with you. Starting the week in worship just does something for your week. It just sets the tone, sets the tenor for your week and for all that God has done and will do. I hope you've had a good week and we're praying for you as we start this new week. We've been in a series entitled Disciple Maker. Disciple Maker. And this series is all about helping us to understand how important it is to bring somebody with us or to help somebody as they follow Christ, right? It's, it's, it's not just about us growing in our faith, but it's about the people that God has called us to help and bring along with us. And so I, I hope this series has been helpful for you. We, have, we had a goal at the beginning of the month. We set a big goal that our prayer is that we would be able to wa launch 100 new grow groups, small groups in the life of our church. And we are so thankful that so far we've got close to 70. Can you praise God for close to 70 new groups that are launching? We've got about 30 more that we're trying to launch. 30 more we're trying to launch. And that could be you in this room. That could be you online. And we pray that perhaps today is the day you will take that next step. But we're going to dive into God's Word today. If you've got your Bibles, open with me to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, I want to read a couple of verses to you. I want to start in chapter 1, and then I'm going to make my way over to chapter 2. But I want to read just a couple of verses for you today. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 6 says this. Verse 6, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 says this. For this reason I remind you, to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God gave us, does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Skip over to chapter 2 in verse 2 and allow me to read that verse for us. Same, same book, but second chapter, verse 2. 2 Timothy 2 and 2 reads this way. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of my many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. Amen. We've looked at several people that have been disciple makers. We've looked at uh, Lydia. We've looked at Barnabas. Today I want to look at a person by the name of Paul, by the name of Paul. All right, let's, let's dive in today. In this Black History Month, we, we know the story of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. We know his story. We know his, his legacy of the impact that he had. But what we do not know is the story of Dr. Benjamin. Well, we often don't recognize that there is no Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. without Dr. Benjamin Mays. It was Dr. Mays who mentored Dr. King. Dr. Mays was the president of Morehouse College while Dr. King was a student there. And Dr. Mays had been a long-term critic of segregation. And he would mentor Dr. King, remain close with Dr. King until his death. As a matter of fact, Mays had an emphasis in two parts. One was on, human be on, on the dignity of all human beings and the incompatibility of American democracy ideas with the American social practices. And those same two strands would also show up in the life and work of Dr. King. We all know the story of Rosa Parks. We know her act of civil disobedience. But we also need to know the story of Ella Baker. Ella Baker was the mentor of Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks was young and learning about the movement before she would ever take that seat on the bus. She would be mentored by Ella Baker, who encouraged her to be trained through the NAACP. Dr. Ella Baker was the director of the branches and provided leadership training and was a role model for Rosa Parks. Matter of fact, it was Dr. Baker who would encourage and mentor, help Dr. King and others to help establish the SCLC. We, we know the story of Thurgood Marshall, the first African American that would ever sit on the Supreme Court. But we also need to know the story of Charles Hamilton Huston. It was while Marshall was a student at Howard Law School that it was there that he would met, meet his professor and his lifelong mentor. When Dr. Thurgood Marshall would talk about Dr. Houston, he would say that he taught us 
to be social engineers, not just lawyers. Even in our own church, some of you may know the story of a young lady by the name of Dr. Kara Collier, who's a physician, a dentist in our community. She's a graduate of Carter High School and Florida a and and Baylor College of Dentistry. But what you also have to recognize that she was mentored by two members of our church, uh, the Baylor dentist professor, Dr. L Dr. Laverne Hollifield, and longtime pediatric dentist, Dr. Donna Berfield. You see, we never get anywhere on our own. There is no Denzel Washington without Sidney Portier. There is no Oprah Winfrey without Maya Angelou, her mentor. There is no Colin Kaepernick without Tommy Smith and John Carlos. There is no Venus and Serena without Arthur Ashe. These, these, these pioneers, Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston and Katherine Johnson and Booker T. Washington and W.B. Dewar, these pioneers, we never get anywhere on our own. And every single one of us in this room is the product of someone else that has poured into our lives. And here's what I want you to catch. Great things take place through the mentoring of others. This is not just true in our lives, not just true in our culture, not just true in our history, but it's also true in Scripture. Moses mentored Joshua, and Elijah mentored Elisha, and Ruth na mentored Naomi, and Mary mentored Elizabeth, and in our text today, Paul mentors Timothy. But friends, one of the keys to making disciples is also found, found in the process of mentoring. That mentoring is this process where, where, where someone in one season mentors in someone that's in a season behind them. Friends, this is the, the call and the uniqueness of how you make disciples, that, that making disciples and being a disciple maker is also found as we walk and mentor with others in life. And the, the truth of the matter is that Concord is uniquely equipped to be able to live out this very truth. Because Concord is a multi-generational church. We, we've got seasoned saints in our church in their 70s and 80s plus. We've got boomers in our church that are in their 50s and 60s. We've got Gen X in our church that's in their 40s and 50s. We've got millennials in our church that are in their 20s and 30s. We've got Gen Z that's in our church that are teenagers and, and, and in school as well as 20s. We've got every generation in our church which means we are uniquely equipped to live out this work that mentoring is how God wants us to achieve his work. This, we find this throughout the scriptures. Consider Jesus Christ, who spends three years of his life pouring into 12. And those 12 will in turn turn the world upside down. And in today's text, we find two, a man named Paul and a man named Timothy. And Paul makes it his chief priority to pour into Timothy's life. And I believe that as we look at this relation between Paul and Timothy, it also will give us insight in how each and every single one ought to be living our lives. Here's the first principle out of the text. Disciple making is encouraging others. Mentoring, disciple making is encouraging others. Consider verse 6. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you, the line on of hands. I want to introduce you to two people. Paul, who is this church planner, this leader who is traveling, and, and, and the person in his life that he is investing in is a young man by the name of Timothy. He, uh, Acts chapter 16 tells us that Paul meets Timothy, and when Paul meets Timothy, he then begins to invite Timothy to travel with him in his second missionary journey. Parenthetically, here it is. We got to understand if you and I are ever going to impact others, if we're going to ever make disciples, it requires us inviting them into our worlds. It requires an intentional investment of time. This is what Paul does. Paul's on a journey. Timothy shows up. Timothy is a young follower of the Christ. His mother and grandmother are believers. His father is not. And Timothy needs a spiritual father to some degree. And so Paul takes Timothy under his arm and begins to allow Timothy, this young man in the faith, to follow with him, to walk with him, and to, and to learn from him. And later on, when these two letters, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, are written, they are written from Paul back to Timothy to help guide Timothy as he follows after Jesus Christ. 
What I want you to notice about Timothy, Timothy is a young person, and this young person, he, he needs this, this Paul in his life. And what Paul does is Paul uses his life simply to encourage and to affirm Timothy as Timothy walks in the faith. He encourages him. Notice the text. He says to him, Paul, he says, Timothy, Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity. It is this reality that for some reason, Timothy has gotten stuck in life. For some reason, Timothy is is timid. Timothy is not at the pace, not at the potential, not at the moment where God would have him. And so Paul takes it upon himself to try to encourage Timothy, to try to reach Timothy, and to try to call Timothy to the place where he believes God wants him to be. Friends, one of the things we must recognize is that Timothy is a young person, that our young people are going through so many challenges in this current moment. When you read the studies and they talk about the impact of the pandemic, they suggest that the greatest impact has been upon those under the age of 30. They suggest that those over the age of 30 have lived, have seen challenges, have seen obstacles before, but this generation has seen more challenges than they could have anticipated at such an early juncture in life. You you don't believe me. You can consider the tragic loss of Miss USA at 30 years old who seemed to have everything in life, who was beautiful and gifted and talented, and yet she tragically committed suicide because of her own battle with depression. But it's indicative that sometimes our young people are processing and dealing with barriers and dealing with burdens and dealing with challenges and dealing with issues that we cannot over look, that we must understand that we cannot simply expect every generation to deal with it the same way, nor can we minimize what they are processing, but the issues of loneliness and the issues of technology and the issues and the pressure and the challenges that they face are real, and so what it means is that God has uniquely called you to help encourage and strengthen them as they manage through what they're facing. Suicide waits on the rise mental health crises and difficulties that our teenagers and young people and 20-somethings are dealing with that we never had to deal with. And yet we must be sensitive and aware to say, here I am to invest in you, to pour in you, to encourage you, to walk beside you because I don't want you to think you are walking all alone. It was just last year that I had to go to two services for young people that had, that, had, that had taken their own lives. This mental health crisis that we are facing, these challenges that young people are facing, that teenagers are grappling with, that young adults are grappling with, it's the very reason why Paul shows up in Timothy's life and has to say to Timothy, listen, I want you to know, Timothy, I am with you. I am for you. I'm going to go where you need me to go. I want you to know you are not in this alone. And that's what mentoring is. It's stepping into somebody's life and saying, listen, I want you to know you are not in this alone. I am with you. I am for you. I am here to listen to you. I am here to walk with you. And I am here to call you and support you into all that God has called you to be. This is, this is Paul and Timothy. And notice what he tells Tim. Look at the text. He says, he says, he says, he says, he says, God didn't give you that spirit of fear. God didn't give you that spirit of timidity. It, 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 if it didn't come from God, it must have come from the enemy. Because the enemy loves to put stuff in our minds, doubt and disbelief and insecurity. The the enemy loves to cloud our thinking and cloud our minds and and make us think we will never overcome an obstacle, make us think it will never get better, make us think that we are just what our friends said. No, instead, Paul shows up and says, listen, I came to you, Timothy, to talk to you today and tell you, Timothy, you are not what they say. You are not what he said. You are not what she said. No, here's what you are. No, no, you, you, you have been gifted. I want you to catch this text. He says, he says, you have, have a gift of God. There are two interpretations of this. On one side, it means that Timothy has some gifts that have been deposited in him by God himself. He says, Timothy, I want you to understand, you don't have to be timid, 
You don't have to be afraid because God has put some stuff in you that God wants to use through you to be able to do his work and fulfill the purpose on your life. And I need every person in this room, every person watching to catch this. You got to understand when you become fearful and timid, you got to remind yourself that God says, I've given you a gift from God, which means God has deposited some gifts and some talents and some abilities and some skills that he's put in you to accomplish the call that's in front of you. And the reason you know this is because when you accept Jesus Christ, he puts his hand on your life and he says, you are my child, and he gives you gifts and talents and abilities that no matter what they say, they can't cancel out who God has called you to be. You just be who he's called you. Don't let your little friend or somebody else make you doubt it. You be who God has called you to be. On one side, he says to him, Timothy, you are gifted. On the other side, he says to Timothy, you also have a gift. On one side, he says, you've been gifted. On the other side, he says, you had a gift. The other interpretation here is the gift refers to the Holy Spirit. That he says, on one side, you've got some gift, but you've also been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you know what the Holy Spirit does, right? It's the, it's the third member of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And God the Holy Spirit, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Spirit comes and lives on the inside of you. And because the Spirit is on the inside of you, you ain't got to be timid. You ain't got to be afraid. You ain't got to shriek because you've got a, you've got a power on the inside of you. you. You've got a power deep down in your heart, deep down down in your soul that allows you to handle whatever comes your way. And then, then Paul says, let me, let, me, let me elaborate on what the Spirit does for you. And Paul, Paul says, listen, what the Spirit does, what the Spirit does not give you fear, does not give you timidity, does not give you anxiety, does not give you, does not give you worry, but instead it gives you three things according to the text. It, it said it gives you, it gives you power. Power, somebody, power. This This is what mentors do for those that they're mentoring. They remind those that there's a power on the inside of you. That sometimes what our young people need, sometimes what we need as followers of Christ is somebody to come beside us and remind us that, friend, there's a power on the inside of you. There's, there's a power that's, 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 that's sourced in you, that you don't have to live life by yourself or on your own. It was a year ago when that ice storm, winter storm hit Dallas. And when that storm hit Dallas, it lasted much longer than ever anticipated. And there, people... Some of you in this room were stuck in your homes, bundled up with multiple layers of covers and going back and forth trying to recharge your phone in the car and trying to stay warm. Many took other family members in their houses because there was no power in the home. And because there was no power in the home, nothing worked. The oven didn't work. The Refrigerator didn't work. TV didn't work. Couldn't charge your phone. You couldn't, you couldn't do much because you didn't have no power. Because the power was out, you were left in the dark. And how unfortunate that some people live their lives in the dark. No power to make decisions. No power to live life when stuff doesn't go right. No power when the doctors tell you no. No power when stuff on your job is not right. No power when the relationship didn't work right. No power. But when you are a child of God, you never have a blackout in your life. You never have to worry about a generator because when you become a child of God, he puts a generator on the inside.
inside of your life called the Holy Spirit that gives you power in dark times, power in good times, power to make decisions, power to overcome your past, power to live beyond what he said, she said, or they did, power to walk with a crowd or power to walk by yourself. You have power. Somebody ought to declare right now, I've got power. I've got power, I've got power, I've got power. You ought to say it right now and declare it in this room and declare it in your house. I've got power. This is the declaration that sometimes mentors got to give to mentees. That sometimes our young people and our teenagers and our, and our young men and our young women are sometimes dealing with so much rejection from friends and friends that have betrayed them and, and, and difficulties when their careers, they graduated in a pandemic and can't get the job, had to go through school virtually, had to deal with all these challenges, and sometimes they need somebody in their life that say, listen, all that stuff you went through, all those people that you had to deal with, all those challenges, God has put a power in you that it may have hurt you, it may have wounded you, but it's not going to finish you. No, God is working through you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. There's a power in you, son of God, child of God. He says, here's what it does. It gives you, it gives you power. But he doesn't stop there. He then goes further. He said, it also gives you, gives you love. He says, you, the Spirit of God, mentee, he says, that's in you. He's giving you, he gives you power, and he gives you love. And this, this love, this love, there's no greater love than a man to lay down his life for another. And in a world that sometimes makes you question, do people love me? Do people value me? Do people see me? He says, he says, I want to remind you that there is a love that God has for you that is unmatched by anything you have ever seen before in your life. He says, I want you to remind you that there's a love that God has for you that is so significant that, that, that God would send his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for your sins so that you would know the extent to which he loves you. He said, I want you to know that his love for you, it's, it's, it's unearned. You didn't earn his love. Because Romans 5 and 8 says that, in, 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 that, that God demonstrates his love toward us. That while we were sinners, Christ died for us. It's a love that is, that is unending. What shall separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus? There, there is no extent, there is nothing that can separate you from the love that Jesus Christ has for you. So whether you have a date or not, he still loves you. Whether or not you get the, you get the job or not, he still loves you. Whether or not they steal your friend or not, he still loves you. Whether or not they understand or not, he still loves you. Whether or not you get what you wanted to buy, whether or not you get it or not and all, he still loves you. Whether you get to move out or you got to still live with family, he still loves you. Whether you accomplish your goals or not, he still loves you. Whether you make the grades or not, he still loves you. Whether or not they understand or not, he still loves you. Whether you get two likes or 20 likes, he still loves you. Whether they appreciate you or not, he still loves you. Whether they get you or not, he still loves you. That the love he has for you cannot be extinguished, cannot be matched, cannot be quenched. You serve a God who loves you. Sometimes you got to remind yourself that I'm loved. You ought to declare it even in this room today, I'm loved. I, I, I'm loved, I'm loved, I'm loved. My, my love is not measured by my job or my love life or my situation, but no, I am loved. And he says the last one. He says, he says, he says love, and he says, sound mind. Some versions say self-control. <laughs> oh, oh my, if, 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 if mentees need anything. Oh, it's self-control. Anybody ever recognize that many times we are our own worst enemies? 
Sometimes you got to pray, Lord, deliver me from me. If I, if I could just get me together, my money would be so much better off. If I could just get me together, my health would be so much. Just, just, just get me right. If I can just get me to do right. It ain't, it ain't nobody else. It's me that made the phone call. It's me that slid in the DM. It's just, it's me, me. Just get me together. It ain't them. It's, it's me. When I want to do right, evil is right there beside me. And he said, he said, what God gives you, it's not just power. It's not just love, but God gives you self-control. And Paul talks to Timothy. He says, Timothy, listen. He says, Timothy, I know you're young. And Timothy, I know this is new to you. And Timothy, I know I have assigned you to this role, this church, to help lead. And I know it's new to you, but I'm praying for your self-control. I'm praying that you'll develop habits in your 20s that will carry you to your 40s. I'm praying that you will learn lessons. The God to give you some clarity in your 20s so that you don't have to make the same mistakes I'm making in my 40s. I'm praying that God will grace you with a level of self-control, with a level of self-control with your finances and a, a level of self-control with your sex life, and a level of self-control with, with, with how you spend your time and what you give your energy, with a level of self-control with men and women, a level of self-control. He's, I'm praying that spiritually you will recognize that one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. Yeah. That, 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 that God gives this to you so that you can live out his Christian life, so that you can honor Christ in your life. And, and, and that's what mentors do. They help mentees. They help them to, 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 to coach them through seasons and periods so they can know the need for self-control, so they can honor Christ in their lives the way he, he desires it to. This is, this is Paul talking to Timothy. And, and it's a reminder. I, they did an experiment once and they, 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 about the impact of encouragement on someone's life. They, they, had a, they had a man, they had a person stand in a cold bucket of ice. They, they were up to ice here, and it was filled with icy water. And they had him stand there, and they began to time how long he was able to stand in the bucket of ice water. They, that was one measure, and then they did the experiment. They redid the experiment. Same icy bucket of water, bucket of water same temperature. But on this occasion, they had people around him. That were, that were speaking words of encouragement toward the person that was in the same icy bucket. And what they discovered is that the person that had people around them encouraging them could last twice as long as the person that stood by themselves. And I came by here to tell you, friend, one of the things you and I got to learn how to do is to encourage those around us because your encouragement could give that person the grace and the strength for just one more day, just, just, just one more day, just one more week, just one more month. People cannot make it without your encouragement. And sometimes the people around you that seem to be the strongest are the people that need it most. This is Paul's encouragement to Timothy. You got to ask yourself, who am I going to walk with? Who am I going to to help? Who am I going to invest in? Who needs to be my Timothy or my, or my Timitha in my life? Who, who, who needs to be that in my life? Here it is, last one and I'm done. <laughs> I'm trying to find a female version. That, that seemed like that fit. Timitha, Timothy, whatever one you got. Um, all right, second Timothy. Here, here's the final person. I'm done. Disciple making is investing in others. It's investing. It's it's encouraging others, but then lastly, and I'm done, it's, it's investing in others. Let me, get, let me get this verse, 2 Timothy 2 and 2. I read it to you. And the things you heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. All right, I want you to catch, I want you to, this is this. So look at what Paul says. Paul says in, verse, in chapter 1, he says, listen, I, I'm, I'm investing in Timothy. Chapter 2, he says, Timothy, you have a responsibility to invest in others. To the he said, he said, I'm investing in you, right? But then he said, I, I want you to make sure that you are investing in others. Hey, hey, Carson and Jeremy and Andre, come on real sec, one sec. Y'all come on real sec. You take your mask off. 
I, I want you to catch this. This is what's happening in this text. I want you to notice this. <clears throat> Let me find this. Carson, you stand in the front. There you right there, right here. All right, I want you to catch this. This is what's happening in the text, right? Just stand right there. Don't follow me. Right there, right there, right here. Right there. There you go, there you go, there you go. There you go. Perfect, perfect. So what Paul, what Paul is literally saying, right, is Paul is saying, I want you to catch in, and that two and two, there are literally four generations in those two and over. Alvin Johnson, would you come in two, please, Brother Johnson? You take your mask off, too. There, these, these, there are four generations I want you to catch that are, that are in this particular passage. Four. I want you to catch it, right? This is, this, is, this is Paul. Paul is the first one, right? Paul says, everything I taught you, Timothy, everything I said to you, this is Paul. Paul says, everything I talked about with you when we walked on our journey, everything I talked to you about as we, as we went from city to city, but then he goes to, he says, Paul, I'm pouring it into you, Timothy. Catch this. He says, Paul invests in Timothy. That's what the text says. He says, he says Timothy, I want you to remember all the letters I wrote you, everything I said to you, all the conversations I gave you. And then he says this, now it's your responsibility, Timothy, to now put it into others, right? Reliable pieces. He says, now I want you to take what I gave you, put it into them. Then he says, and they have an expectation that they will also teach it to others. I want you to catch there are four generations in one text at the same time. I don't want you to catch this by coincidence. You've got a mature generation that God needs you in this church, that God needs to work through your life, that God wants to use your lessons. God wants to use what you've been through, but God doesn't want you to hold it, but God wants you to use it and pour it into Timothy, who might be in their 40s or 50s, but they need all that wisdom. They need all that investment, but then they got to pour it to somebody in their 30s that need the same word, that need the same direction, that can pour it into somebody that's in middle school that needs direction and affirmation, and this is where the gospel works. This is how it works. It's not one generation against another. It's no, we all need each other, and we cannot become who God has called us to be without the future generation. If Timothy doesn't have Paul, Timothy don't know what he's doing. He over here getting married again and again and again, talking about it's the woman, but he needs a man to tell him, no, bro, it's you. You need a man to say, no, man, that ain't how you do it. You need somebody to tell you what to do. And this brother can't make without him saying, this is how you manage your money. This is what it looks like to follow Christ. This is what it looks like to trust him. This is what it looks like. It's not that. Then you need somebody talking to a brother in high school or a sister in high school saying, hey, I went through the same thing. They didn't get me as a Christian either. They didn't trust me. They didn't follow me. But guess what? You keep letting your light shine on every classroom, on every court, on every football field, on every dance team. You shine for Christ wherever he puts you. But it don't work unless every generation owns and embraces exactly where Christ has called us to be. I want you to catch one other observation in the text. This is something that you see from Paul's life. No, stay where you are. Stay where you are. Stay where you are. This is something you see from Paul. Here, this, is, this is Paul right here. This is Paul. All right? This is Paul. This is Paul. But I want you to catch another picture. No, sorry. This is Paul. And what you see by Paul's life is Paul has three relationships. Let's guess this. Paul has a Barnabas that's ahead of him. He has a Barnabas that's ahead of him. He has a Barnabas. He, he may have more theological training than Barnabas, but it don't matter. He don't have more life wisdom. He got a whole lot in his head, but he ain't got much in his heart because he ain't been through nothing. He just, he just smart. And, and so he needs this one ahead of him that is coaching him. But then I want you to catch this. Paul also has, come on, stand right here. Paul also has in his same life season, Silas. He has with him Luke, others that travel with him. He has one ahead of him. He has several beside him because all of us need friendships in our life. You, you cannot grow by Christ all by yourself. You're going to need some people beside you to help you as you walk through life. But then he has a Timothy that's behind him. So he has one in front of him, one behind him, and he pours in the Timothy. But it's these three relationships that make Paul 
know who he is. And guess what? You need the same three in your life. You need a Timothy, a Paul, and a Barnabas in front of you that can coach you and guide you so that when retirement comes and decisions come and singleness comes and you're in your 50s and 60s and you got to ask somebody, how do I do this? And how do I navigate through this? And how do I manage through my body changing and my marriage changing and my family changing? Am I going crazy or did life change at 50? I just need somebody to tell me I ain't crazy. I just need somebody to tell me that's normal. Ain't nothing wrong with you. It's called midlife and God's going to see you through that and you'll be all right. But don't lose your mind. <laughs> stay where you are and stay in God. You're going to need somebody ahead of you. But then you're going to need somebody with you. They driving their kids all around. Y'all both tired and y'all both broke. And you just wait till one day if I can just get them out this house. If I can just get them through school. If I can just get them through elementary. If I can just find a school. We're going to get through this thing. We tired all the time. But then you're going to need somebody behind you. They in high school, college. But you pouring into them. And you saying, listen, stay focused on your goals. God has gifted you. God has equipped you. Just stay focused. Don't let them girls distract you. Don't let those boys make you lose your mind. Don't you lose your sexuality to somebody that don't really love you. Come on, you got to stay focused. I know you fell off, but get back on track again. Don't let pornography get the best of you. Stay focused, young sister. Stay focused, young man, because God has a plan for you. And when you get all through I believe this is what disciple making looks like. It ain't just about you. It's about you asking God, send me the right people into my life so I can honor you as I walk with you. And friends, that's our prayer. That if you catch this vision and you begin to find somebody important to you, and you begin to find God sends people that can walk beside you in life. And then you start pouring back into the next generation. That's when church becomes what the church is called to be. This church is not about showing up and having good church and going back home. But if, you're, if it's not changing your life, if you're not pouring into somebody else, if you're not invested in somebody else, you are missing the whole picture. It is about mentoring and discipling and investing. Because you know good and well, friends, if it had not been for them, you wouldn't be where you are today. And because you are here today, you have the responsibility to turn and invest in somebody else. I am a product, we are products of men and women that have poured into our lives. And our prayer and our desire that you would catch that same vision and then take it and invest in others in the same way. God has uniquely equipped our church we ain't got to argue about who likes what and who gets what and whose the focus is. And no, no, no. We're all on the same team, headed the same direction, trying to do God's Word. It ain't about that. It's about reaching the lost, reaching the one, and about the future that God has called us to. Family, would you bow your heads right all over this room today? Thank you, man. I appreciate you. Would you bow your heads all over this room today? And would you just take a moment right now, just reflect on what God has said to you today. Reflect on the truth that he's revealed to you. Maybe you're the mentee and you heard God's word tell you that you ain't got to be timid, that you ain't got to be afraid, but you can be powerful, that you can be strong. Or maybe you're in this room today and God is saying that you need to begin investing, mentoring others. And maybe you need to begin praying about the people that God has put around you. Maybe it's your grandchildren he wants you to build and invest in. Maybe it's someone on your job. Maybe it's someone in this church family. Or maybe he's calling you to start a small group and to start the group with those just a little behind you. Whatever the case is today, I want to invite you. I want to call you. I want you to pray, God, show me my next move. Show me my next move. Say, show me my next move. Maybe, maybe you need some friends, and God is saying, I want you to pray for those friendships and those relationships. I want you to cherish those. I want you to build them. Or maybe you feel like you're all alone, and maybe you ought to just pray, God, send whoever you want to in my life. Guide my steps. Order my path as only you can. Come on, just take it to God today. 
both in this room, online, wherever you are. Just take it to God today. Yes, sir. He is indeed. Father, we come today and we just want to say to you, Lord, that we thank you for, for all you've done in our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for the mentors that you've given us. Whether it was a coach or a co-worker or a boss or church, a church friend or a pastor or a a family member, whoever it was, we thank you, Lord, mothers and fathers. We, we thank you, Lord, for those that have poured into us. And now, Lord, we ask God, use us to invest and pour into others. We pray, God, for the relationships. We pray, God, that you will reveal. We pray that you will show. We pray, God, that you may open doors for what you want to do in and through our lives. And, Father, we just commit it all to you, and we say thank you, God, that all that you've poured into us was not just for our benefit, but it was also for the benefit and for the impact of others. So, Father, we trust you and we honor you. It's in Jesus' name that we say this prayer and we trust you. And God's people said amen. amen. Come on and bless God together in this house. We've now come time in our worship